and I'm live. Here we go. It's very exciting. I've never done anything like this. So the class is going to start in just a few minutes. I will actually start doing classiness um, at right up at 12, which is when I said the class would start. But I saw that there were a number of people already here. And so I wanted to go ahead and go live. And if anything is going on horrible, you can let me know. I see, I can see the chat. So thank you, KB, for saying hi, because that let me see that I can see the chat. I really appreciate that. So for those of you who are interested in how this kind of got started, I woke up Saturday morning and I was thinking about just all my friends who are teachers and all of my, I have former students who have kids now, and I was just thinking, what can I do to help? And Jennifer, let me answer your question. I think the actual class will be about an hour. I haven't taught this exact lesson before, and so I'm not 100% sure, but that's my plan. Hi, everyone coming in. Thanks for saying hi. I really appreciate it. So as I was saying, I woke up Saturday morning and thought, what could I do to help? And I thought, I wonder if I could teach a class online. Like, how would I do it? What would that take? And what would I teach? Because I realized that the real need is for our older kids. There's a lot of ways to, and a lot more resources for our elementary students. And so I thought, I know I want something for our secondary students. And so I wanted something grades seven through 12. So that's what this is geared to, is get grades seven through 12. So if there are kids who are younger who can handle it, absolutely, they're, you know, that's fine. But I'm gearing this, the intended audience is, is students who work at grades seven through 12 level. So I thought, well, let me do short stories because we do the short story um, line uh, the, the short story genre from like second grade through 12th grade. And so that worked. Um, and so that's what I chose. And I spent some time choosing stories and I tried to pick stories from a wide range of grade levels. And I wanted different voices. So some um, American authors, European authors, Russian authors, which Russia is actually the largest country in Europe as well as Asia. But I, I picked different ones. And so I'm, um, I'm super happy that so many people have been interested in it. So I'm really excited and I'm going to start the class now. Those of you who are here, thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoy it. Now, um, I'm Mrs. Van. I'm your friendly neighborhood English teacher today and I want to thank you for joining me. Now, in this platform, you can use the chat to respond. Um, but that's optional, no pressure. When I ask questions, if you want to put responses in the chat, that's great. If you want to just write on paper, let me just, this is paper. We used to write with it. Um, and so feel free. You will want some paper. So if your mom or dad is making you do this, ask them to go get you paper and a pen. I mean, it's the least they could do, right? They're going to make you do this. So I'm expecting this class to last about an hour, but... It may be a little shorter. It just depends. I haven't taught this lesson before, and I'm not sure. There's a little bit of a delay. So you see me seven or eight seconds after I actually say the words. And because of that, I'm not sure how checking your responses is going to go. But that's my guess, is about an hour. Okay, so what you will want to have is a, um, you will want to have paper, as I mentioned, you will want to have something to write with and you for the next lessons for days two through ten you'll want to have a copy of the story printed out if if you um if you can if that's not possible or practical then don't worry about it but it will help you to be able to to write on the story and then you'll need your brain in third gear what i mean by that is if you've ever driven a car that's like manual transmission like going from first gear when you first start to about 15 miles an hour and then when you go faster you go second gear and then when you're on the freeway you're at fifth gear right so what you want what we want is like third gear so first gear is you're just sitting there watching it but you're not really thinking kind of like a video you might watch while you're doing something else 
and fifth gear being you just can't think about anything else and you're frantic, you want to be in about third gear. So that's where we're going to be in this class. And you will want to be um, careful with your identity. Please don't say like, oh, my name is so-and-so and I live at this address, right? Don't do that. Be careful with your identity and be patient with the technology. I'm hoping that it all works beautifully. But even just this morning, Microsoft have a, had a big problem because so many people are trying to use distance um, technology because of the coronavirus, then it's putting a lot of burden. So be patient with the technology. Okay, so I'm super excited you're here. Now, if the technology goes wonky and goes sideways, my plan B is I would switch immediately to a Facebook Live. But I, that's, I hope not to have to do that because I can't show you my slides that way. Um, I don't, I'm not set up for that right now. So, but if, if so, we'll switch to that, but that's, I'm not planning on it. All right, so today we are learning three things. We're gonna learn how to identify a short story, like what is it? We're going to learn how to analyze a short story, like how do we look at a short story? What does it mean to look at a short story besides just reading the words, just decoding the text? And then we're gonna learn about the writing suite 16. So I am interested, if you would look at that list of those three things, oh, I just shook my desk. Um, I wish you could see the back end of this because it, it, there is so much techie goodness going on over here. In any event, um, of those three things, I'm curious about which of the three you think you're probably strongest at. Are you really solid at identifying what I mean by a short story? Like if somebody says short story, you're like, oh yeah, I know the short story genre. I know exactly what you mean by that. Um, I could teach you and then or maybe it's an analysis like are you good at looking at plot and setting and characterization and analyzing conflict and all of that like are you really good at analyzing and then maybe you are an excellent writer so of those three which do you think you're the strongest at and which do you think um, you're the most curious about now we're not going to do an actual story today we're going to start with our first story tomorrow, which is the necklace. But the, um, so if you haven't read a story yet, don't worry, because we're not going to do an actual story until tomorrow's class. Today, we're doing an introduction to the genre. Ah, I see a question. What is writing Sweet 16? And that tells me you are curious about it. So let's talk about the genre. Now, imagine you are going to build this super cool city block out of Lego okay imagine oh, uh oh I just I just minimize my screen um, imagine that you are going to build a super cool big thing out of Lego it's got a billion bricks and it's super intricate when you do this uh, that takes a lot of bricks I mean you can tell quite a story with this many bricks you can be really detailed the person looking at it doesn't have to imagine that much in their mind, right? Like they can see everything down to the people and the awnings and every little precise detail is there. So this would take a lot of time. And when you were done, it would be really impressive, even if somebody didn't know anything about Lego. Now, imagine that if you're going to write a short story, you have to use all the same elements. I mean, you're using the same bricks, but you only can use a few of them, right? You, you don't have 5,000 bricks. It's a short story. It can't be 800 pages, right? You can't tell everything, but you still have to have a setting. You still need a brick that's setting. You still need a brick that's a narrator, and you need a narr narrative perspective. You also have conflict. You also have theme. You also have figurative language. You also have symbolism. You also have characters. See what I did there? You also have character. You have all of the bricks, but very, very few of them. But you have to tell a story using just those few bricks. And it's very similar to the difference between writing a novel or a longer fiction piece and writing a short story. You have to include all of the elements of fiction but you can only use a few of the bricks. And because of that, short stories often require more of the reader than longer fiction happens. 
than, long, than longer fiction does. So do you remember this story, Stone Soup? Probably a lot of you read it when you were in like kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And it's how they were going to make soup by um, somebody starts with a stone and they put it in a pot and like, oh, I can make stone soup with nothing but a stone. And then, oh, but it's a lot better if you add this and it's a lot better if you add this and it's a lot better if you add this. And in the end, it ends up being this full on soup that the stone was just not even needed, right? So short stories are very much like stone soup. They taste best when we bring a lot to them. Um, in a longer piece of fiction, the author can feed you more. The author can give you everything, just hand it on a platter, like here you go, and you don't really have to do that much work. But in a short story, if you bring nothing to it, if you don't put anything in the pot, then you're, you're a stone soup that's just stone, right? You're just a stone by itself. I see someone likes that book, it is fun. What I'm hoping that will happen over the next couple of weeks is that you will know what you need to bring when you examine a short story, even if you've been doing it for years, like even if you've been learning about short stories for years, even if you've been reading about them for years, even if you have always loved them. So the short story genre is one of the most beautiful things that literature has to offer, which is actually saying quite a bit. So I'm hoping that you will like it. If any of you like to cook or if any of you are cooks, you may have made what's called a reduction. And that's where you have a, a sauce of some kind and you cook it down and a lot of the liquid evaporates and what it does is it leaves this concentrated flavor. And that same thing is true of short stories. Short stories are in a lot of ways a reduction. So the shortest short story that I, I am aware of that is famous is only six words. It only has six words in it. And I'd like you to consider what this story asks of the reader. The reader has to fill in the entire thing for him or herself. Now, a little inside scoop trivia about this story. There is, um, if you just Google it, it will come up that, oh, Hemingway wrote this and it was on a bet and he, but that's not true. He did eventually get credit for it, but it was, a, it had been around for quite a while. But just think of the story of this, right? For sale, baby shoes never worn and the reader has to bring everything there the reader has to bring the emotion of oh they bought these shoes and then they they don't have a baby like that's what the reader has to bring and that's just one example but you will find that as you gain skills you will bring so much more to the story and when you bring more you get more just like stone soup tastes better when it has a lot more in it Okay, now, when you see this slide, that is a clue that it's time to use your brain. So I will always clue you in when it's like, oh, okay, stop looking at the chat and look at, and think about what we're doing. Use your brain and really engage in, the, um, in what we're doing. So that's a hint because now I want you to, to think. Engage your brain. What is the shortest thing that you've ever read that actually mattered to you? It was short, but it really mattered to you. And what's the shortest thing you've ever written that actually mattered to you or to someone else? So I'm going to be quiet for just a second and let you respond to that. You don't have to respond in the chat. You can just write it down or you can think it in your head. But what's the shortest thing you've ever read that actually mattered to you? And what's the shortest thing you've ever written that ever mattered to you? One last question. What is the shortest thing you've ever said that actually mattered to you or someone else. And I hope that by thinking about this, you realize that things don't have to be long to be meaningful. I mean, probably the shortest thing I've ever said that mattered to me or someone else was when my husband asked me to marry him and I said, yes, right? It's a single word, but it changed both of our lives. And so things don't have to be long. 
Okay, so now let's look at identifying a short story. What exactly is a short story? So first we're going to look at the rules. Like if you just Google, what is a short story, right? What, um, what does something have to be to be considered a short story? So the first thing is, oops, I went ahead a slide, is that a short story is short narrative prose usually centered around a single event or mood. A short story normally captures a single moment in time. It's not trying to be all things to all people. It's not trying to cover a series of events, a long-term thing. It's, it's focusing in on one thing. It is short narrative prose. So if it's poetry, it's not a short story, although some fiction writers have been experimenting with more poetic form. But in general, it's narrative prose. How short? Well, shorter than a novel. That's helpful, isn't it? So a, the conventional wisdom is under 10,000 words, but 10,000 words is actually quite long. Some short stories are really long. You may have been assigned a short story by a teacher and thought, this is supposed to be short? This is taking forever, right? But conventional wisdom is under 10,000 words. Now, it, that's an ish, right? If you want to be published, if you want to publish short story, like let's say you want to write, then you can um, then you can expect to do between three and five thousand words as, as that. So we're not reading any really really long um, we're not reading any really really long stories. So I can see the chat going through, and I'm a little bit concerned about some of the stuff that's not helpful. So this is a class. So. My husband has this open on their slide. I'm just going to block you if you're posting stuff that's not reasonable to this. So if you could log in as me, I don't know if you can, and just block people because that's not what we're doing. Okay, so that's that's what it is. Now, here, here's how I can tell. If you need a bookmark, it's not a short story, right? It's not a short story. Now, Edgar Allan Poe wrote an interesting piece of fiction um, a, 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 an interesting piece analyzing fiction and how he felt about fiction. And what he said was that he found real value in things that could be written in a single sitting where you just sat down and just devoured it in that moment where it wasn't taking over long periods of time, right? Um, there is a unity of impression, he said, where you just have one thought about it where there's some consistency in how you're thinking about it and that is um, possible because it's short right because what he said was that if you start reading something and then you leave and go do something else right you set it down and you go back into the real world that then the real world interferes with how you are experiencing what you've read and he said that he had found for himself that the perfect length of a poem for that was 108 lines. And for a short story, we're looking at an, a reading experience you can have where you just sit down and you read it and nothing else interferes. And so those are two different views of it. So one of them, we've had this dictionary view of it. And in this other, we've had this idea of more of the emotional connection to what you're reading. And so... I would like you to consider, having learned here about what is a short story, to think, do you agree or disagree that you generally like reading short stories? Like generally, I like reading short stories. Some people like them just because they're short, right? Some people like them because it is their preferred genre, either for reading or writing. So do you generally like short stories? Do you like short stories, but when you read for pleasure, like if you're just going to pick up a book and read it, then you like longer books or even series. So just think, do you like short stories, but you like reading for yourself longer books? All right, brains on, brains on. Um, you can, I just sketched this out with a pen, right? We're not getting fancy here. If you have a piece of paper, just sketch out a little Venn diagram and consider, I'm sketching it with a pen right now myself, what's the difference between how Poe viewed a short piece of fiction and what that dictionary definition was. I don't mean what's the difference between Edgar Allan Poe and a dictionary. I'm saying the dictionary definition of short story and 
a dictionary, um, or I'm sorry, and how Poe felt about short stories. So that Poe emotional idea of a single impression, something that you could read without being interfered with by the world, um, certain length versus that idea of the important thing is that it's a certain length, but it centers on a single event, whatever. Sketch that out. And what I'm really curious about is not just how different they are, but also where are they similar? What, what is a similarity in there? And if you can do that kind of analysis of seeing I've got two different ways of looking at the same thing and I can actually analyze that, then you are strong in analysis because this is exactly what it takes to look at literature. It's the same mental skill as it takes to look at anything. Gave you a second to do that. And now I'm interested in this question. Can you think of a comparable thing in any other content area? Like, is there a short story equivalent in math or science or social studies or the arts or athletics? Like, is there any other genre, or there, is there any other content area that has where there are these varying lengths of things that you would engage in that are accepted, like an equivalent of a genre in these things where some would be long and some would be short and, and that's the thing that really distinguishes them from each other. Kind of curious if you can think of one. And now, considering, so thinking about what we just said about short stories, right? Do you think that short story is the best term for this genre? Like, is that the detail that's the most important? Like, is that the thing that should define it? Usually we name something because that's the most important thing about it, right? The red house or the big house or something like that. So is short story fair? Like, is it fair to call it that? Or maybe not even fair, but is it best? Is that the best term that we could think of? And could you think of another name? So I'm looking in, in the chat at some of the things coming in. So word problems versus equations, nice. Yeah, like multiple choice question versus a word problem, nice. Um, so that, that's a great example of, of it in another genre. Thank you for that, or another content area. So if you could think of another name for short stories, I'm kind of interested. I'm seeing, um, Sophia commented that in art, you could have a portrait versus a whole installation. Great idea, love that. All right, so now we're moving on to analyzing a short story. How do we go about analyzing a short story? So when we are analyzing a short story, we're going to go back to that Lego idea for a minute. When we're working with short stories, we use the same tools, right? Those same, those same Lego bricks that we're using. We've got setting, we've got narration, we've got theme, we've got mood, we've got tone, we've got figurative language, we've got author style, we've got conflict, characterization, symbolism, but we've got it dialed down. We've got it dialed in. Now I'm going to assume that you've heard of those things before. I'm going to assume that you've heard of setting and plot and all of that before. And so I'm going to be discussing those things in kind of more mini lessons as we go through. I'm not going to do a lengthy how to analyze literature in 30 seconds or less, but you can, um, but you can know that if you've heard about plot and setting and characterization before, you're going to be using those same tools to look at short stories. So one thing that I think is important is that we look at perspective as well. And this is less commonly done in class. So I want to talk about it for a minute. I don't think this is as commonly done by teachers. And so I want to mention it separately. Perspective is not what I'm, I do not mean narration. I don't mean like first person narrator or third person narrator. What I mean by perspective is how narrow did the, how narrow did the author go? How, how narrow did the narrator go in looking at the thing? So are we looking at broad sweeping streams? Kind of like if you're putting a filter on a photo, 
right? Like it's kind of fuzzy. Like I don't know exactly what happened, but I kind of know what happened. Or is the author dialing down in every single minute detail? Like the author tells you exactly what you're supposed to be seeing in your mind. All the colors are described. All this, all the scents are described. Like everything is described. So I think that when we're analyzing things, it's important to look at that. It's important to consider, am I seeing just the big picture view? Is this a 10,000 foot view? Or am I seeing very specifically what the author wants me to see here? And how am I being manipulated by the author because of that, right? How is my view of this being adjusted and changed because of the perspective, because of whether I'm really zeroed in or whether I'm really spread out. All right. So I want to talk about plot briefly because it's so important and it's one of the ways to make sure that you understood the gist of what happened in the story. While plot is not necessarily the most important thing to look at in a story, it is important to make sure that you understand what happened. Otherwise, it's harder to attach everything else to it. It's hard to analyze how important different things were if you don't understand what happened. So plot has um, this diagram we're all used to, right? What plot is, is a pattern. It's a pattern that story typically and traditionally follows. First, we have the backstory, right? The backstory is where the current pattern is established. There were three little pigs and they lived in a house with their mom. And then there's an inciting incident. The inciting incident is the thing that breaks the pattern. The pattern breaks and it sets a story in motion, right? It's almost like those of you who like science, it's like Newton's law, right? Objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by outside force. And the same thing is true of an object at rest. An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. And in literature, the inciting incident is the outside force that acts on, on this pattern and sets the story in motion. And then you have rising action. So a series of events or thoughts that lead to a climax. The climax is the moment of greatest emotional intensity in the story. So this is where it like all comes together. And then you have falling action after the climax, and then it ends in resolution or um, what sometimes you will see the term denouement. That's the French term. It literally means untying of the knot. So you will follow this pattern in virtually every story. Now, some stories will have very brief ones, right? Um, very brief sections and lengthy, lengthy, lengthy other sections. Usually the falling action is much shorter. Because the moment of greatest emotional intensity is the climax, it's hard for an author to keep reader interest for a long time after the big reveal, right? So let's look at a story um, that is really short and compare it to this plot diagram. So we've got Little Miss Muffet. So Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating, sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Well, that's the backstory, right? That's the backstory. That's, that's the establishment of the pattern. This is what Little Miss Muffet does. She just sits here eating curds and whey, which is like cheese. And along came a spider. Oops, I went too fast. Sorry. That's the inciting incident, right? Along came a spider. She was just sitting there and here comes a spider. And now it sets the story in motion because she's not sitting there. Then along came a spider and sat down beside her. And that's the climax, right? It's a single line. The spider came right next to her, right? And then all, that is the moment of greatest emotional intensity for Miss Muffet. And then it frightens Miss Muffet away. And that's the resolution. That's the end. This story has so brief of a falling action that we don't even see it, right? We don't see her scream or get up or run away. It just it, she frightens Miss Muffet away and she's gone. So that's this short story, which is a, basically a nursery rhyme, but it still follows that same pattern, that same pattern. All right. But plot is more than this. So back to Edgar Allan Poe, we're going to actually look at him. A, we're going to read a story by him, but we're going to use him a lot. Um, Poe said that plot is more than this. Plot is more than the sequence of events. That plot is also the pattern and design of the story. Plot is also the way that the author connects different elements of the story to itself, like how 
the use of foreshadowing, the use of flashback, all of that is part of plot. Plot construction means that the author is also going to um, be more complicated than just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Plot is also like, and then this happened, and that's related to what happened before, and that's happened to what happened, that's related to what happened later on in the story, and that is related to this thing and that thing. So the interconnectedness of all things is also part of plot, according to Poe, and we're going to look like that. We're going to look at it like that. In fact, Poe argued that you should the author should consider starting with the ending of a story. All right. All right. So time to put your brains on and in gear. I would like you to consider if your life were written out as that standard plot diagram that you just saw, that series of, of lines leading up to a climax and resolution. If your life up until this point, up until right now, if you were to write the story of your life from the time you were born until right now, I'm curious as to what you think the inciting incident would be. Like what is something that set your story in motion to where you are right now, like the kind of person you are right now, the things that you like, the friends that you have, the place that you live. What is it that has set your story in motion? Kind of curious. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch the chat for this. So I, and I'll respond to a little bit of the chat while you're thinking of this. I will be hosting further classes every day at 12 Central from now through next Friday. So every weekday, Monday through Friday, at least for the next two weeks, we'll do that. From the, um, all well-written books follow the hero's journal journey. Yeah, so what I would say is characters follow the hero's journey. It's not the plot necessarily, that, but, but most store, almost all characters follow the hero's journey. So yes, there will be more classes. I'm just responding to this while you're thinking of your... Um, of your life and your inciting incident. Moving. Yeah, moving is often an inciting incident because you have to find a whole new place in a school. You have to find new friends. Oftentimes moves are prompted by a big change. Like you move because there was a job loss or a promotion or a new job or divorce or something like that. Being born is not your inciting incident. That being born is the backstory, right? You have to be born to establish a pattern for it to break. So when you meet your family for the first time could absolutely be um, an inciting incident if you meet your family not at birth. Kindergarten when you met your best friends. Okay, I see when my sister was diagnosed. Yes, absolutely. Like you see the power of these inciting incidents, right? Something that establishes a pattern. And a lot of times the most powerful things that set our story in motion are not even things that happen to us. There are things that happen to people around us, people who we love, people who we care about, um, and that is what influences our story so much. All right, I could read, I could read those all day. Okay, so going more forward with analysis of the short story. So a lot of times, what teachers start with when analyzing short stories is what we call the context of the story. The context of the story is looking at. The, the biography of the author. It's looking at the history, like what was going on at the time that the author was writing. I pulled up a few slides that I found of other teachers who were introducing students to Huckleberry Finn. And so they're pulling up like what's going on in the geography, like what's the geography of the Mississippi River and, and what was going on in history at the time that, that Mark Clemens or Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn. And I think that this is really important. It's, it's interesting and it's what teachers start with. But I think that when we look at context, we can't stop there. We also have to connect the story to itself. Don't get so caught up in the extraneous details of what surrounded the story and the context of the story and trying to deconstruct like, oh, well, he wrote this specifically as a response to this or this happened in his life and so that's why he wrote it. And the reason that I caution against that is because when authors write, they're writing for a purpose. Like, why did the author write this? They didn't write it just for that moment in time. They're writing it for a greater purpose. Most authors believe that they have, um, that they have something worth saying. I mean, especially in the short story genre, although it's short, it's really difficult. And so when authors are writing in the short story genre, 
they have something to say that they think has universality. They think there's a message here that the world could benefit from hearing. And that's going to be beyond, that's going to break the barriers of the context in which they were writing. It's not just about their personal story. It's not just about the times that they lived in. It's not just about the geography. It's not just about the definitions of words that are less familiar to us now. And I'm not saying that some of that isn't true or useful. I'm just saying that we also need to go beyond that. We need to look at what Poe was talking about is how is this story folding in on itself? How is this story connected within itself? What repeats in the story? What do we see happening again and again? Or what syntactical choices do we see happening over and over? What happens and why did the author put two very different things next to each other? And the technical term for that is juxtaposition. Like, why did he put a super nice person next to a super mean person or something super dark next to something super light? So what, what is happening within the story? What's the context inside the story? So not just the external context, but let's look at the internal context. Okay, so I saw a question go by in the comment and I'll, I'll answer before we go on to the next thing. And that is that um, there's not required reading, but I suggest that you read the stories for the next day. And at each day, I'll tell you what the story is. Although the flyer, I'll post the link to the flyer in the comments below this video once the um, or in the description below this video once this video goes live I'll put the I'll put that there or not live really but the recording goes up I'll put a link to it so you can get if you don't already have it you can get links to all the stories there's nothing to buy I link to free versions of all of the stories and we're gonna do one short story every um, every day so all right next thing is I want you to consider whether you agree or disagree that your analysis skills, just the, the little bit that we've discussed, the idea of looking at plot, setting, characterization, um, figurative language, all of that, um, theme, tone, mood, n the narrative voice, all of that. How strong are your skills? So just think to yourself, I agree or disagree that my analysis skills are already pretty strong. Um, next, agree or disagree that you have areas of analysis that you like better than others, that, that you prefer looking at the characters or you, or you prefer looking at the plot rather than trying to deconstruct the tone or the mood or identifying elements of figurative language. So do you have different areas of analysis that you like better than others? And do you agree or disagree that you could improve your analysis skills? Like, do you think that you could improve them if you tried or wanted to or had a good teacher or whatever, other, other factors going on. Do you think that your analysis skills could be even stronger? Okay. And I saw, I'll just mention while you guys are thinking about those things, is that I saw some of the comments go by about being louder and I've got my mic up as loud as I can, but I will try between now and tomorrow to try to see what we can do to get it any louder. I see some of you say it's fine. Hope you may have to turn your volume up. I'm not 100% sure why it's quieter, but I will try to make it louder by tomorrow. Okay, next. Oh, look at this. I like the tone and the mood better. Nice. Okay, and agreeing that you always improve. I didn't know if I'd really be able to see the chat or keep up with the chat because I am a little bit behind, but I'm finding that I'm really in, enjoying the those of you who are feeding back with actual stuff related to what we're doing. So in order to unify our study of these nine stories over the next two days, so we're going to be looking at nine very different stories. We've got five male authors, four female authors. We've got Americans. We've got Europeans. We've got all kinds of different authors. What I want 
to make sure that we're doing is that we're unifying that study. And so the way that we're going to unify that study is that we're going to look at each one of these stories, every single one of the nine, through the lens of justice. And I picked this before I picked the stories. And so the stories will differ in how easy it is to fit them into this unifying, overarching, universal theme. But we're going to look at it uh, through the lens of what is fair, what is right, is there equality, do people get what they deserve? Like, do characters get what's coming to them? Are people rewarded or punished when they should be? Now, even though some of these stories are very, very different, we can put them together in a unifying whole by looking at them through this theme. Okay. So, now, we're going to be doing all the normal stuff. We're going to be doing all the normal stuff that you're used to with class, in class. Setting, figurative language, all of that stuff. We're going to be looking at all of that. But we're also going to be doing a little bit of disruption. We're also going to be doing a little bit more um, with them. So be prepared to go deeper. Be prepared to really think. So, all right, brains on. Remember, when you see the slide, it means get ready to think. All right, I want you to think of a story that you've read where there was injustice or unfairness. Now, usually the author uses that to create conflict to drive the story, right? There's injustice, and so then there needs to be revenge. Like, that's the whole plot of the Count of Monte Cristo, right? Is revenge, that there's been this great injustice done. And the injustice could be real or perceived, right? And if was that the case in the story that you read? Meaning when you read a story with, with injustice or unfairness, was the author using that injustice to drive the story? And if not, what purpose did it serve? So I'm going to sit back for a second and see if some answers to that come in a little bit. The one and only Ivan. Oh, that's a good example. Black Frontiers. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, The Book Thief and The Most Dangerous Game. Okay, so The Most Dangerous Game is another um, is another short story. So I actually almost did that one. Uh, I almost chose that one. Interesting. The Lottery. So we're going to read The Lottery. Yeah. Letters. Oh, Letters from Birmingham Jail. Yeah, absolutely. The Giver. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. So The Giver, a Perceived Injustice. Yeah, I get. I guess. Yeah, like in the broad sense of injustice. Nice. Oh, I'm loving these answers. Thank you. Um, the Hunger Games. Oh, absolutely. The Hunger Games. Spot on. Yeah. Harry Potter for sure. Yeah. Nice. Okay. You guys are awesome. Oh, Fahrenheit 451. I'm getting some book suggestions from this. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move to the next part, the Sweet 16, which I know you, you weren't familiar with because I made this term up. So unless you've been my English student in my own classroom, um, and I live in Texas, and so there are real live kids who've been in my class, and, um, I, and I taught English and social studies. And so I use this term for my students, but if you aren't my student, you won't have heard about it. So in writing, in the written language of English, we have 16 elements or tools at our disposal. Like if a writer had an actual toolbox, like a physical toolbox, and they had tools in it, there would be 16 tools in there. If they went to like the writer's version of Home Depot, there would be no more tools. These would be all the tools. And these tools are three different kinds. So. Put your brains on for a second here because we're going to look at them. Get ready. The first of the 16 are, the first seven are seven parts of speech. Now, you probably were taught eight parts of speech. I am voting interjections off of the island for our purposes. I think interjections are so natural. They're such a more part of speech that you're aware of. Like interjections are things like, wow. That's amazing. Uh, they're flavoring particles like well or so um, it, in, when used as a 
not as a conjunction, so can be an interjection, right? Like, so are we going or not, right? Um, so I'm voting interjections off the aisle island for our purposes and just focusing on the main seven parts of speech. So we have obviously nouns, pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, and conjunctions. No matter how good of a writer you are, this is all you get. You don't get to say, well, I'm a super sophisticated writer and so I need more parts of speech. No, that's what there is, right? That's what you get. So you have those and then you have six phrases. So you've got seven parts of speech and then you have six phrases. Now, I'm wondering, can you name any of them? Do you know any of the phrases that we have? I'm curious. So we have six phrases. And I, the reason I chose this image to go with them is because I think they are like magic. The six phrases are like magic. They are the secret sauce. They are so rarely mastered. All too often, we look at phrases like grammar rather than like a writer's tool. And because of that, we instantly reject them. We instantly think, oh, I don't like grammar, so I don't want to learn about these phrases. But the fact is, is that when you feel comfortable with them, when you use them to write and you know what you're doing, like you know how to use the tool, then, and you understand what you're seeing when you read them, you become a way more powerful writer and you become a way more powerful reader. So these six, the six phrases, they're just magic. And those six phrases, see if any of you had it. Oh, I saw a prepositional phrase go through. Okay. So that was one, right? Um, you have absolute phrases, you have gerund phrases, and just pro tip for any of you who are going to take the SAT, a gerund phrase, and I'll, I'll probably cover it later in one of the stories, but a gerund phrase is when there is a verb acting like a noun. So like, um, Jose is running around the pool is really bothering me. The, the subject of that sentence is Jose is running around the pool. So even though running is a verb, it's a gerund there. It's acting like a noun. And so Jose is running. Now, on the SAT, every single release SAT I've ever seen has had a question where they put a gerund in and they want to make sure that you know that before the gerund, you have to use the possessive. I can't say, Jose running around the pool is driving me crazy. I have to say, Jose's running around the pool. Or I have to say, her reading the book is wonderful, right? Like that, I have to use the possessive form, the belonging form before the gerund. So pro tip, if you're going to take the SAT, possessive before the gerund shows up every time. We have infinitive phrases, prepositional phrases, which I saw, and then participial phrases and a positives. And we're going to be looking at those in the writing itself. So don't get scared that we're going to be doing grammar. What we're doing is writing and looking at these as tools. Now, if you're, if you're counting, you see we've had seven parts of speech and six phrases. So we got three left. What are they? They are clauses, not like this, not like Santa, right? The three clauses are more simple, more simply named. The phrases are the thing that have kind of the cool secret, you have to know the secret <laughs> um, names, but they are like, the clauses are like butter and salt. They are like butter and salt, meaning they make writing much less bland. Without clauses, you're going to have writing that's a lot like if you just boil vegetables and eat it with nothing on it. Very few vegetables taste best that way. So your, your clauses are like your butter and salt. And there are only three of them. Curious about any of you know. So I'm, you do not have to know, like I'm seeing some questions about the phrases. You don't have to know what they are. I don't, I don't care. I was just questioning, like, have you heard of them? Because these are the tools. And these week 16, I'm going to be sharing with you. And so you don't, you don't need to worry about whether you know it already. I want to just share it with you in a different way than maybe you've seen it before. Okay, so here we go. The three clauses. The three types of clauses are adjective clauses, adverb clauses, and noun clauses. That's it. And almost all of you know what adjective nouns and adverbs are. So clauses are different from phrases. I'll be going into it 
um, more as we go through. But that's the Sweet 16. And if you master the Sweet 16, you are totally on your way to world domination, like Henry VIII, but don't cut off anybody's heads. It's like, if you can master the Sweet 16, if you really feel confident that you know strong verbs, if you are familiar with using a variety of prepositions, if you, if you know the parts of speech and recognize them when you see them, that's really all you need to do. Is it, The parts of speech are just knowing what the vocabulary word you know does, right? But if you know those phrases and clauses, friend, really you can take over the world because so few people like to write. And the less that you are, the less that you are um, in a field, like let's say you know when you grow up, oh, I want to be an engineer, right? Well, very few engineers are writers, right? Very few engineers, writing is their favorite thing. And so the more you are skilled at it, the more you like it, the more powerful your toolbox is, the stronger your toolbox is, the more you stand out. In fact, the hardest place to stand out as a writer is with other writers, right? So those of you who are not, those of you who are not like, oh, I love English class, it's my favorite, or I love writing, I want to be a writer when I grow up. Those of you who are people who say, well, I love math, or I love, I love sci- I know I'm going to be a scientist, or I know I'm going to be a doctor. The doctors who can write stand out. And if you want to be a doctor, and if you want to see a writer who stand out, who stands out, go read Atul Gawande. Um, actually, I'll type his name in the chat box myself. Um, Atul Gawande is a surgeon who became a writer, and he is amazing. If you don't like writing, then it's even more important for you to master it because you, the more you master it, the better you'll like it and the more you'll stand out because you probably um, are in going to go into a field where very few people do. All right. So the, I will tell you that we are not really going to focus on all 16 of these. We're just going to look at nine. I feel pretty confident that you already are familiar with parts of speech and that you recognize nouns and verbs I and prepositions and conjunctions. I think you get taught that pretty well. We're going to focus on just nine. We're just going to focus on phrases and clauses. And I promise if you stick with me for two weeks by the end of it, not only will you be a better reader, but you will be surprised at the power of these phrases and clauses in your writing. So somebody asked the question, how is scientific and engineering writing different than writing? It's not that it's different, although it is more technical. A lot of times scientific writing will have more graphs, right? It's almost always nonfiction. Although if you want to go into science fiction writing, it's important that you know the science. But most like technical writing, it's nonfiction. It's got lots more diagrams and graphs. It uses a lot more citation um, than, than fiction and narration. All right, so we're going to be looking at those nine. So today, this is what we've learned. We've learned how to identify a short story. We've learned how to analyze a short story and just the basics of what we're looking at with analysis. You're going to learn. We're taking a deep dive into analyzing short stories for the next two weeks. And we've learned about those writing suite 16. So it will. the class will go on again tomorrow, 12 p.m. Central. So that's 11. That, that would be nine no 10 sorry do a zone time zone converter right um when it is noon my time which is when i go live it's um 10 pacific time 11 mountain time 12 central time and one o'clock eastern time if you're not in the continental united states then do a time zone converter to see what that is and they will and the videos will be available on the youtube channel afterwards Okay, so um, I want you to think back to if you, were, if you were in the class at the beginning of it and I asked you, which of these things do you feel you know the most about? Now that we've gone through them, do you still feel that same way? Do you still feel that same way? If you, um, if you have been here the whole time, do you still feel the same way that you're the strongest at one of these things? And do you feel like you have more or less to learn about it than you thought you did? 
All right, so now comes the super fun part. Let's write. We're gonna write something. It's time to be cool, like this guy. He's so cool, and you know why he's cool? He's cool because he writes. Writers are cool. People who write, they're cool, they just are. So you have three writing opportunities. If you are through eighth grade, like up through eighth grade, then your writing prompt is this. In about 200 words, so plus or minus 200 words, I want you to discuss the most interesting plot you have ever encountered in a reading experience. What did you read where the plot itself, nothing else, not the characters, not the themes, nothing else, just the plot was the most interesting of any story you have ever read? And what made it interesting? And in what way is the plot the most important part of the story? So if you that's for if you're up through eighth grade. If you're in ninth or tenth grade, I want you to write about 200 words. Compare the inciting incidents of two different stories that you've read. And I want you to analyze which of those authors was most effective with the inciting incident. Which inciting incident like set the story most powerfully in motion, led to the most conflict, created the most opportunity for really strong rising action and led to a powerful climax. Use in your analysis, use some strong adjectives. So I gave you some suggestions. Is the inciting incident that you're looking at one that you've seen before or not? I want, a, I want a nice analysis. Then, if you are in 11th or 12th grade. The video is blocking up. I don't know if you should like, like, cut to the bottom. Oh, okay. Um, my husband's telling me my video is blocking the 11th or 12th. Okay, so let me go here and I will move, whoops, not that. I will move this over so that you could see yes. it. Um, if you are in 11th or 12th grade, same length, about 200 words, I want you to share your response to this statement. Stronger readers are less dependent upon plot to make a story worth reading. So take a stand, agree or disagree with me. And then think about when you're doing that analysis, think about what other aspects of story might drive reader interest. So what else changes as you become a stronger reader? And give this some thought before putting pen to paper, to paper right? Give this one some thought. Now, some of you are like, I'm not gonna remember what that was, and that's okay, because um, you will be able to um, get this. So if you go to bit.ly.com slash Mrs. Van hyphen folder, then you can upload what you wrote into this folder. There's an uploads folder inside the folder. And if you want a tutorial for how to upload what you wrote into the folder, then go on this YouTube channel. There is already a tutorial there. And on the Gifted Guru Facebook, um, which I'll put a link in the description below, the, that same video is there. But the easiest, because you're already on YouTube, the easiest is going to be to just watch the tutorial that's already in YouTube. So watch the tutorial if you don't know how to use Google Drive, it will show you how to upload it. So you can either write in it, you can create a Google Doc right in it and write there, or you can write on your own computer and upload it or your phone and upload it. So you're gonna look at the folder. The folder for today is the one with today's date, which is March 16th. And the title, the name of that folder is the date and then genre intro. Inside there, if you go inside that folder, you will see those writing prompts that I just showed you. Um, that you will see that there's a document in there that has that there so you don't have to just remember it okay so you can share that right um, in there now let me give you a couple of things um, to oh let me let me give you a couple um, tips on this that it, it's in the tutorial but I want to say it that folder um, people who have the link can see it so don't put anything identifying on there I do want you to tell me what what grade you are so that I can, if I give you some response, I will. If I, I will give you responses depending on how many I get, but I do want to take some of them and use them as examples in the coming days. And so if you want to participate, you don't have to, this is just optional, but if you do want to participate, then upload it and I may take what you do. So if you are in... A classroom where your teacher has asked you to do this then they may have their own content management system like you may they may have Google Classroom or Canvas or Blackboard something like that that they're having you put your writing in there you don't need to put it in mine as well I'm only having you put it in 
the one that I showed you, and I'll go back to that link. Let me go back to that link right here. Um, I'm only having you put it in there if you would like a chance for me to look at it and give you some feedback on it. So if not, um, so um, if not, you don't have to participate. So I see that a couple people are saying they're getting a 404 error with that bit.ly. Um, I'll have my husband check it real quick. Steve, can you check the Mrs. Van Dash folder? It's working. It's working. Okay, it's working. So um, that's it. So I will be back tomorrow, 12 o'clock Central, so 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 Eastern, with our first short story. So if you have a chance, read it. Um, the stories that you are going to compare, I saw a question, do they have to be short stories? Nope. It could be full-length novels that you read. It could be anything. You could compare the inciting incident of a short story to one in a novel. That's fine. Um, and so I will see you tomorrow, and we'll be discussing the necklace. So if you get a chance to read it, please do, and it will help if you print it out. So the necklace tomorrow, and I'll see you then.